español es muy malo, so lo siento. Um, I'll start with a piece. This is called Kalimbatar, and then we'll get to some exercises. And anytime you have questions about anything, please let me know. Um, so I'll start with this first piece called Kalimbatar. <laughs> Thank you. 
questions so far? Uh, I have a question about the, yeah. um, how, how does it work and how, so this is, how is it called? This is called a kalimba. kalimba. And a kalimba comes from Africa. It's about a thousand years old. Mm. And um, one of the interesting things is that there's so many different versions of a kalimba. Usually it's a percussion instrument. You, you play with your thumbs. And uh, I saw, I'm from Philadelphia, and I saw an African art exhibit, and somebody was playing one of these, and I thought it was like the coolest sound ever. So I went home and tried to find one online and searching for, on Google, and I found a really small one, and it was very quiet. Um, and I put it on top of a box, and it sounded louder. And then I thought, oh, acoustic guitar, it's a box, you know? <laughs> so I set it on top, and it resonated through the whole thing, and I got... You know, I was very excited, but it was only in one key, so I could only use it for one song. So I started researching if it's possible to find kalimbas that have a much broader range. So uh, what I did is I, I started this, this idea with Martin Guitar, and then they kind of sent me to a couple of other luth private luthiers, and then uh, I designed a bunch of these, and uh, I helped construct this one. And so it's two octaves chromatic, so I can play in any key. So I have options to be able to play sharps, flat, you know, uh, and natural notes. And um, this is the most recent version uh, uh, of this instrument. I'm still working on fine-tuning it. But the kalimba and the guitar together I call the kalimba tar. The very first one that I had, I just stuck on top of the guitar. And it choked the sound of the guitar, and it was really, really difficult to hear um, the sound of the guitar and the sound of the tines kind of uh, conflicted. And now, I don't know if you can see, but there's a gap between the top and the kalimba, so it doesn't actually touch the top. And it uses, a, uses the back and the sides of the guitar to resonate. Um, so this has been kind of an experiment of mine the last eight years or so. And I'm just trying to explore what's possible between steel strings and steel metal, and steel tines. So, yeah. And how, how does it work, the, the kalimba? So, the kalimba is usually, it works like if you were to play uh, on a piano, like C, D, E, F, G. Yeah. A kalimba typically will go like C, D, E, F, G. It, as you work your way out, that's how it goes up a scale. If I put on here, when I wanted to do chromatic, if I did C and C sharp next to each other, it would sound like this because it, it vibrates the surrounding tines, mm -hmm. so I had to separate. The sharps will go on this side, and the naturals go on this side, and that actually allows each note to ring free. So that's how that, that comes through. Most kalimbas have like a, a that sound, and I wanted something that would ring really. They just kind of ring like a Fender Rhodes piano or a handbells chime, something like that. That was kind of the sound I was going for. Pedals uh, specifically for the kalimba. Yeah, so I run. I have three outputs here. One of them. It goes to the kalimba, which goes to a compressor. And then one of them is a, uh, there's a pickup under here. And then I have microphones inside the guitar. And so those go all out to these. These are the preamps. And then uh, I have volume pedal, which is a little staticky today. And then reverb, and then delay. And then I have this reverb, which is a little bit this one's this one has been driving me insane this tour. And then this one <coughs> is just a little less. Yep. Alright, let me try. This one will incorporate some more harmonics and percussion.
this was E, oh, okay, E, B, C sharp, F sharp, B, D sharp. And sometimes with tunings, um, I just kind of, you know, mess around, experiment till something sounds good. Mm -hmm. But it's like, um, if, you, if you make a painting, sometimes when you have an open tuning, it sort of is an outline already drawn, because like when you, that'll like give you, there's your one chord right there. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I want that. Sometimes when I'm looking for a tuning, I want an outline, and then I can kind of just, uh, you know, find ideas from there. When I come back to standard tuning, I feel like it's a blank canvas. I can go almost any direction. So I play mostly things in standard tuning, but some in other open tunings. Um, but I, sometimes um, with different tunings, I'll work on an idea and I think, well, if this is tuned a little bit down further, then it's less of a stretch. And so then that's when I can arrive at different tunings. But um, I'm really enjoying standard tuning these days, which is a big <laughs> That's a big no-no in the finger style scene. Uh, for the last piece you played, yeah. uh, did you approach the composition in specific... I mean, did you tune your guitar to, to find the, the riffs in that song? Or did you just improvise and kind of found it? I, I, for that specific one, I had a melody in mind, and I knew that I wanted to, um, honestly, you know, I went back to the other tuning, but I knew I wanted to have the, the main theme to be uh, uh, easy to reach, and in standard tuning, I don't even know if I can do it at... the uh, open strings then it was a much easier to grab some of those so that one was kind of I had the melody in mind and then I started tuning till it could get a little bit easier and then once I realized I had those open strings <laughs> then I could form some other chords around that so a lot of times with uh, an open tuning you can get these really big sounding chords um, sometimes I try to do that with just standard tuning so for instance instead of like a I have a version of a C that goes, which it sounds almost kind of like a, an alternate tuning. So sometimes I'll find a chord and then tune to that chord. Sometimes it's a melody and tune to make that easier. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, and also for the harmonics, did yeah. you, uh, wh where does that idea come from? Uh, where harmonics comes from? No, or uh, the, 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 the melody. You play. Of, okay, yeah, so I did like, um, I think for that one specifically, it was just kind of experimenting what is the main melody and finding where the available harmonics are. Because if you change your tuning, then the harmonics change too. Then it's different, so, exactly. Yeah. So you kind of have to explore. It's tricky. Yeah. Like, one thing that's really cool with harmonics is that you can, you know, they call, like, you have harmonics on your fifth, your seven, and then the 19th fret is the same. Yeah it's, a mirror. yeah, it's all the same. So once you change those, that, that gets different. But um, the same way if I did a melody like... Um, like if I do that with harmonics. Like using harmonics to actually be part of the melody. Once I find where all of those are in standard tuning, I take that concept can I, can I continue a melody with harmonics? Then when I go to another tuning, I just search till I can find them. And if I can't find them, then you do the artificial harmonic, which would be, you know, the, like that, you know. Um. Like that kind of thing, you can't find that. You could do like, like that, but you'll have to like kind of adjust. So a lot of it is just kind of trial and error and just, you know, does this work, does this work, if it doesn't work, if it sounds bad, well, okay, that doesn't work for this key, then just keep looking. Is that how you approach composition in general? Uh, I approach composition like, I like the idea, I, I like a strong melody, I like to always have a strong melody if possible. And so sometimes I'll, I'll hum a melody or I'll get an idea in my mind, I search for it on the guitar and then I always ask okay, where, I, I always try to let the melody lead the way, like, where are you directing me? Um, when I was younger, somebody said to me, play, when it comes to composition or playing in general, 
play notes that you would want to listen to. You know, it's a very simple idea, but that's very, that was really helpful for me because it wasn't play what you think looks cool, play what you think will impress someone, play what you would want to hear. Yeah, play because in the end of the, of the day, it's, it's something you have to enjoy. Absolutely, absolutely. And that, that was helpful for me because that helped me think like, okay, every composition, I want to actually be a part of it. I want to believe in every note. And so if I'm playing what I would want to hear, what I would want to feel, when I have an idea come through in a composition, I usually have that in my mind. Okay, where, where's the next thing? If I heard someone else playing this melody, where would I want to hear it go? You know, so I'm kind of composing as a listener. So that's how that other melody came about. Um, most recently, probably the last two albums or so, I've had a melody and then I've worked it out on Guitar Pro, um, you know, inputting it into Tab, and then kind of just finishing a piece that way and then consulting the guitar later. Because a lot of times as guitar players we get you can get stuck on the familiar shapes. If I'm focused on the sound and software and I'm and I'm really, really I'm falling in love with the sound that I want and the composition starts to come together. When I come back to the guitar, I'm playing shapes and things that I wouldn't play normally and that always keeps it fresh. You know, so um, so yeah. How do you keep it realistic? I mean, because in Guitar Pro you can make crazy things happen. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, chord shapes like this, and exactly. it's not very ergonomic. So how do yeah. you keep it realistic and playable? I the composition kind of comes first, and it forms, and then I have like that's very uh, right brain, it's the artistic side, and then the left brain comes in, and then I'm sort of problem solving. So maybe I'll try a piece. This might be a mess. Maybe I shouldn't because we're recording. But I have a brand new piece that I. Had, d had done this, I worked it all the way out through Guitar Pro and then I pretty much just had to sit and problem solve and if something seemed impossible I would look at my local options and if nothing seemed to work then I would change the note. Um, but yeah, the, the figuring out how to play it always comes later for me. Initially it's always what is the sound, what is the inspiration, what is the feel that I want and then I sort of consult technique later. So I guess when you know how to play like that, you can just make do whatever you want. <laughs> well, you know, there's some players who can like. There's not a gap between inspiration and actualization. If they if they just catch an idea and then they can just immediately go to the fingers and play. I can't. That's not. That has never been a strength of mine. I've always felt the inspiration. I have to kind of sit with it. I have to think about it, and then I have to work. You know, to get onto the fretboard. So, the great players like it takes someone like Pat Metheny. You know, you guys know Pat Metheny, where like any any possible thing that he can feel is just like immediately to the fingers in there. So I, you know, maybe someday, but that that's something that I'm always working on, making sure that the gap between what I'm hearing and feeling and what I can play becomes shorter and shorter. You know, so uh, that works into like uh, technical exercises. So we'll talk a little bit about this. Um, one technical exercise that I do every day. When I first sit down to play, there's a lot of times like, um, you know, I'll, I'll start playing something and maybe a finger will hit a wrong string and it takes about like 10 or minutes or so to kind of get adjusted. This exercise I found is the best. You do this for like two minutes and your fingers are ready to go. So I start with an E chord. I got this exercise and I, I sort of varied it, but I got this exercise from um, a classical guitar book. And the whole idea is that you go four in a row, so thumb, index, middle, ring. Then go to the next string. And then up to here. So I'm basically doing kind of like four strings at a time. And then, so index here, then thumb. And then... On my way back down, I'm going three, two, one. Three, two, one. Three, two, one. get used to that, that's one thing, but now, do it this way. Start and stop the note immediately. So this is called a staccato free stroke. And the hardest thing is to not go, like on this hand, to stop the note this way. You want to be in control of the start and the stop of every note. So I'll go 
like free stroke. throw on a metronome and just kind of go with that. That has really helped me so that immediately when I go play another song, my fingers know exactly where the string is because I have to be in control of starting and stopping each note. So that's a good one. So you can do whatever chord you want on this side, but that's a good one to start with. Um, the next one, I, I think the most important thing when it comes to finger picking, this was explained to me, we were just talking about like using a thumb pick versus your fingers. If you use a thumb pick, this doesn't apply because this will be wrong, but I was taught like more of the classical style where you kind of want to look for a triangle between your thumb, your, index, your, your fingers, and the strings like this. So when you're looking down, you're kind of going like this. If the strings are here, you want the thumb here and then these. I was taught that way, and what that does is actually allows your hand to use the best part of the muscle. So for instance, if, if I take your finger like this and go like this move from this knuckle here and go as fast as you can. You can feel that start to get worn out. Now do this. You can feel a difference. So no matter how much you work to get this knuckle up to speed, it will never be as strong as this is already. You know, Same thing happens with any electric guitar players if you're doing hammer-ons, right? If you're doing anything like this, these hammer-ons, you want to launch from this part of the finger. So that's very different than this. So it's the same kind of concept. Use how your hand is structured already to your advantage. So back to this kind of triangle thing, what you want to do is the thumb is going this way, these fingers are going this way, and that's what gives you a good relaxed technique. My teacher used to always say, like, if you put your arm out and relax, relax your wrist, bring your hand up, then when you come to the guitar, just let it fall. So it's, it's, very, it's a very natural position like that, yeah. So there's a lot of guitar players we get used to like, you know, sit down and play and then start in like this really awkward position. And sometimes just, even if you're doing like a weird, you know, a strange chord, like remove the neck, that can't be good, right? <laughs> you know, there are some chords you just have to do that, but in general you want to, guitar is very visual, like it will look, and sound similar. If something looks really choppy, it's going to sound that way too. So you want to try to be as natural and, and flowing as possible. And that's something that I'm constantly working on. I've not mastered that. I'm always working on how can I make it flow better. So um, this is a really good exercise to start with that. Then the next thing I like to do is get, this is kind of similar to working on your alternate picking is working on these, and I'm in Spain. You guys know how to do this better than anybody in the world. This is, this is something that I've worked so hard on, but a good exercise to get started with this is just called finger walking, where you're kind of going to go like index, middle, index, middle. So you're just varying the fingers as you're walking over. I always found that in alternate picking, the hardest thing was when you cross to the next string. You have to go down, up, down, then up to the next string. So if you work on exactly that situation where you cross the strings, then that helps. And that's where this comes in. <laughs> when you're doing your scales, it's a much more easier, easier time. So then I go from there and I want to, then I just started kind of developing some exercises to get this hand moving. So then let's take something like this. I'm going to take like a, this is like a first inversion G arpeggio. Like that. And I like the sound of that. I, I have a lot of uh, arpeggio patterns that are kind of one note per string. And then after you get up here, then I'll, then I'll kind of turn around and go back the same direction. take that and move that different spots. Great 
great is that's a great sweet picking. So this is not just finger picking, you can do this with sweet picking too. Um, and then what I'll do is kind of like... Uh, and I like that, that that's sort of kind of, you know, I'll set the metronome and just kind of go on that for a little while. Does anyone have any questions so far? Can you repeat the, the, the finger pattern of this? Of this index? hand? This yeah, so this this one I usually start with the index. So I'll go, I'm sorry, the thumb. The th I'll start with the thumb, and instead of the index, I go thumb, index, middle, index, middle, index, middle. And then on my way back down, I do a pull-off, and that allows me to go back to middle again. So I'm doing two middles in a row, but the pull-off is in between. And then middle, index, middle, index, thumb. So I want to start where I, I come back to where I started, you know, back to the thumb. Does that make sense? Like that. And then I, I do the same thing with uh, hammer-ons. So I'll go... Try. I, uh, one of the biggest limitations in my uh, when I was first starting to do a lot of the tapping stuff was like this finger. I'd go, you know, it, like each finger got a little bit quiet. So take it slow enough. Make sure everything is even, and that helps. Um, this helps your playing in general. You don't have to do all the tapping. It's just, you know, stronger hands will make everything a lot easier. And then I take the same thing, and you have to kind of adjust the pressure depending on what part of the neck you're on. So if you're going... It's not as fun to listen to, but it's fun to play. So, how many um, hours do you practice a day? I and try I mean, these kind of exercises. These kind of exercises, I do about thirty to forty minutes of just technical, Every day, yeah? of just technical exercises. Yeah, my whole my whole th practicing is usually about three hours a day, um, <coughs> three three and a half. Yeah. Um, after a while, like, I find that after three hours, whatever I'm practicing, yeah, I, I kind of cut it off at that point. But also, I have uh, a, a three-year-old daughter, so, like, you know, at a certain point, I, I can't, you know, put in the six, seven hours I used to. Are you doing every day, yeah? Yeah, I try to, yep. My whole life, I've been, you know, musician, right? You, you stay up late, and you sleep late. Now, having a daughter, I try to go to bed earlier, and I wake up early in the morning, and so now I have kind of early morning hours, and that is really, really great, because by the time, you know, I'm ready to have my morning coffee and breakfast, I've already put in three or four hours of practice, oh, and then the rest of the day, I'm not thinking like, oh, when am I going to find time, you know, so I find that that's been really helpful. Um, it may sound weird, but like if you use your phone as an alarm, Every time the alarm goes off, it like scares you and it makes you angry, right? I hate that feeling, so I bought this alarm clock from eBay and it like simulates the sunrise, so like before, like a half hour before your alarm goes off, it like, uh, it starts low and then every minute it increases till your alarm goes off, so you're like subconsciously awaking, so now every morning I, I, I wake up and I'm like, ah, <laughs> instead of, no. <laughs> so try, try one, look one of those up. They're called like sunrise clocks. So it's good for practicing. Um, okay, let's try, should we play another, you know what, let me talk about another option. This is a really unique, uh -huh. so this is called a tone wood amp. What I love about this is that you can you don't have to plug into all the pedals to get reverb. There's a speaker on the back and that actually resonates through the whole guitar. So I'll show you there's there's uh, magnets here that stick. You have to put magnets in the back of the guitar. So I'll just show you I'll just show you how it works. These, there's like a sort of sticky tape here. Sorry, this will take a second. 
So that sticks to the back, like this. And that'll hold on there. And then you have to have a pickup system, anything, because what happens now is it goes out from here, and then it goes into this, and then the speaker goes into the rest of the guitar. So I'll show you what it sounds like. That's your own innovation? No, this is a company called Tone Wooding. All right, all right. Yeah, this is, this is new. I think they came out maybe a year or two ago. But um, this is like an amazing thing to practice with. And I'll also show you when you can use this as your effects processor. I'll plug into the sound system with, with this. But I'll start just acoustic here. So there's a little screen, and we have different options for sounds. I'll dial in my favorite one first, and we can talk about some of the other options. So that's completely unplugged. The speaker's going through the, gu the guitar, excuse me. Like you can hear it coming through here, but when you're playing it on this side, it's like it just fills the whole space wherever you are. So what I love about this is how easy it is. You don't have to plug into an amp, and uh, you know if you need to be quiet at home, this is a really really good tool. So let's try. I want to plug this in. Let me see if I can do. I haven't tried it through these yet, but I'm going to turn off my reverb. There we go. So all you hear, there's no, there's no other effects in here. I'll turn this level down. That's just the reverb from here. So it's, it's, I love the reverb. That's a plate reverb. So I want to go to one of these other ones. I'll start with, this is kind of the standard one that it comes with, a hall reverb. And you can adjust to make it shorter or longer. So for instance, if I want less decay. So I have the hall <coughs> reverb, and then I have a room reverb. plate reverb, which we started with. Someone once told me, that's too much reverb. I'm like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand. Do you have a delay? You can adjust all of that. And then, let's see what our next one is. The tremolo delay. Then we have a, a Leslie speaker. I love that, that's a cool sound. Chorus, this is very 80s. adjustment settings that you want in here. So the cool thing is just basically that you can do this acoustic or you can plug it into your, your sound system. Um, they have options where you can pl uh, uh, plug it into the computer and you can load different sounds into it from there. So this is kind of like the new hip thing. So you guys got to get one. I'm going to play an old jazz tune. I've been, uh, this song is about, this was 1942. 
uh, by Hoagie Carmichael. This is called Skylark. And uh, I've just been working this up the last little while and trying to do it on this tour. So this reverb is sounding good with this, so let's do this. This is called Skylark.
uh, yeah, the tone would have. So check it out if you guys are interested in purchasing one. They were very kind on this tour that if you if you go to tonewoodamp.com and type in Trevor Gordon Hall, you get like uh, a certain percentage off. You can get a discount. Um, but yeah, check these out. These are a really fun little tool. Um, how much time do we have? Are we like an hour or something? Okay, minutes? cool. Uh, we can go a couple different directions. You want to do some more exercises? I have a question yeah. regarding exercises or bird gossip sounds. Yes, okay, let's talk about those. Yes. All right. Um, so, like, yeah, when you plug this in, there's different settings. You can uh, basically uh, EQ and you can do the volume and all that, so just setting that. Um, when it comes to percussive exercises, um, I guess, well, do you have a question to start? I mean, I, I could go a couple different directions, but... Um, no, no. How to start? Explain yourself. The whole... Full, the full. There's so many uh, guitar players now, um, it's really common in fingerstyle to use this section of the guitar. When I have a kalimba on there, that's just no go. I can't go anywhere down there. So I kind of developed a system that's all local to the strings here, and plus I think it's easier than going back and forth down here. Um, there's great players that get great sounds like that, so like a that kind of kick snare thing. I like to have all of that up here. So for instance, uh, to do a good kick drum sound, I used to try to use like the butt of my hand like this, and then I tried to use kind of like the uh, this part, and anybody who's experimented with uh, percussive guitar, like this part can get bruised very easily. So you want to use kind of like the bottom of your wrist, right around here. That gives you a really good kick sound. And every guitar is going to respond a little differently, so. And then I grew up listening to, you know, death metal and punk rock records that always had a really loud snare. So I like that sound of like a really loud snare. And so without effects, what I'm doing is kind of like I'm hitting this part of the guitar, uh, this part of the hand on the top of the guitar, and then kind of like the, the rest of my finger like that. It's almost one motion, like that. And I love the sound of like that very loud. So now I'm kind of almost using this as to fill in parts of the beat as well. Now, so we have a kick, we have a snare. These fingers right here, you can go back and forth to almost become like your, uh, uh, your hi-hat. So what I'm doing there is I'm going to go down, and then I'm going to go up, and then snare, then up. Now what I like to do is do like a bass and a flick here at the same time. This is a technique pioneered by Michael Hedges, if you guys have heard of that guitar player, he's amazing. Um, so you're kind of like, instead of thinking about like trying to get a hit and a strum at the same time, you're kind of just like letting your hand go like this. So as, as it comes in contact with the guitar, it's flicking out, and that gives you that sound. And what that does is allow you to do a down, so like, instead of, because you, you, you can miss that sound. So, so that's, that's one way to start it. And then the next thing here I like to do is just add different kicks in different spots. You have to adjust the direction of this in order to accommodate because if you always try to go that can kind of like mess with your head think about like one and two and three and four and you know your when your foot hits the ground is the number and then and so one and two and so whenever you have to hit this part here just make sure you stay in line with Sometimes you can go a little bit off and go different directions, but you kind of want to keep that, that going. Another, like, then you can get more complex with it. Start adding 
chords. So when I was first really getting to this, I started with uh, Let It Be. And then just add, so the very simple chords on this side, and then just add. Now the other problem that I had is when, uh, and I would just play through the whole song so you get used to doing it not just in little bursts, but like the stamina and the, the groove of a real drummer, you know. Um, when you have to hit here, then this makes it a little bit easier to keep a sound going, so like, like that. So sometimes I'll add an extra strum to keep that chord going. is a bad example, but... So I'll change the strum a little bit. And then practicing anything reggae just feels good in general, but... do like the, the ghost strums. And just set five minutes, set ten minutes and just do it non-stop no matter what to, to get comfortable with it. Now when it comes to doing stuff, so that's kind of the basic Incorporating that into fingerstyle, what fingerstyle does a lot is do hammer-ons and pull-offs along with the percussion thing, and that's where you're taking it now from here, but also thinking about rhythm here, so different parts of the beat are covered. So for instance, here's a really good like um, slap harmonics. Wherever, you sl wherever the chord is, you want to be 12th fret above. So here, like a C chord. Or I'll go to a C major 7, just pull this off. So I'll slap here. Right? So now I have da da da. to do the percussive thing a ton. There's a lot of players that have every part of the guitar completely covered. Um, I, do like at, I do like to use parts of the guitar, like for instance this up here. This is a really cool sound. So there's one, there's one groove that I came up with that kind of starts in... So this hand is thinking one, two, three, one, two. And this hand is thinking one, two, three, four. So that's another cool thing that you can get into like the ghost notes. So for instance, instead of like down here, um, so now we're not doing like a kick and a snare, your snare is covered by this sound hit there. I do this, like the very first song I played goes, the snare hit is more of a closed fist, which is kind of like an elbow movement. And then a lot of the guys like Andy McKee, all those that like, they kind of do this. That's more of a thumb hit. And depending on what you want, if you do this part here, that mutes all the strings and sometimes you want that. Sometimes you want, if you want to let those strings ring out, then that's another option to do that. 
so now when it comes to uh, uh, incorporating more of that into, um, I'm trying to think what the, uh, a good example, like um, if you're going, this is probably the best way to, to think about it, like we'll just do like a real brief example. So I'm going. A, you know, G, A minor, G over B, C, E, F, 9, and then, and then, uh, adding in the ghost notes. Opening riff, I had a lot of those. I have a strum there, ghost note. And then I hit there. So that's kind of an introduction of how those work. If you have a good, like, um, when I was trying to get uh, a hold of how to understand rhythm. I had a teacher kind of draw a giant grid on the board. I don't have a, a board here, but picture like one column being beat one, then the next one and two and three, you know, all the way so it's a giant grid. And then just put X's in any three of those boxes. And so you're, what you're doing is kind of, list, uh, you're learning the separation of the beat. So if, for instance, if it's like one and two and three and four and just clap along to wherever the X's are that you choose. Does that make sense? And then you make it more complex. You do one, a, one E, uh, two E, uh, so you have three columns you know, between the numbers, and then four, and expand it from there. And then all I would do is line up different fingers with where those hits are. And that was really helpful to understand, like, okay, if I have a rhythm that's going here, and I want to add a rhythm that's going here, without feeling like you're getting lost, you'll understand where they fall in the beat. I hope that makes sense. So that was a really helpful thing for me, understanding rhythm. So let's talk a little more about the arpeggio thing, because I think this is, this is something that I'm really getting into the last two years or so. Um, when you do this one, so back to, to, to this one we were talking about, you can take the same pattern here and move it to different spots, and this will work for sweet picking too. So. I love that sound, so there's kind of an add nine. And then I'll take that and make a minor version. But it's basically the same pattern. And then a dominant version. So instead of, I just go, and the pattern stays the same on this hand. And so what I like to do is just make progressions. So we all know, Never heard that before, right? <laughs> um, so just making different progressions with that. doing things like that and then maybe I'll move it to this, these are fun things to practice you know anyway so you can three shapes same pattern here and you can move it all over the fretboard um, let's do one more. I've been working on this a lot recently, is trying to incorporate... Um, so banjo thinking on guitar is really fun. Instead of thinking of a scale this way... This is one of the cool things about acoustic guitar and finger picking that is available to you. So now instead of going up a scale, 
going off the scale, but sometimes you're doing an open string, and then sometimes you're going to a lower string to get a higher note in this situation here. The sound of that is really cool because the, whole, the idea is that if you use any available open string, instead of, you know, it just gives you more. And what I did here, that I think I played this earlier, I think the same way about available open strings as I do about is there an available harmonic. You know, that opened up my playing a ton. So now, uh, one thing I was practicing recently is, you know, uh, Beach Boys, God Only Knows. Uh, how's it go? You know, so trying to take, our, now I'm mixing the arpeggios, and the open strings to keep the melody going. And this is new, so let's see, this might be a disaster. just uh, taking a melody that I love and just... You know, so I have that open, available to me and this. And that's pretty much doing the same thing. A lot of my arpeggio um, uh, uh, approach is basically doing kind of the same fingering on this side because that gives you a lot of possibilities. I had a couple other, let me see if I remember. Um, this there's one exercise that I do a lot. This is this is a uh, uh, Julian Lodge. Do you guys know who that guitar player is? He's a uh, really great jazz guitar player. But he has a, an exercise that's this is he does it with a pick. So this is a good pick exercise as well as finger picking. Start with some triads. He does like a. but it's really fun. So you can take that same idea. And what I like to do is whenever I see um, a guitar player, you know, I'm always hunting down different exercises because they're fun to play. They, um, you can, once you get them under the fingers, you can kind of do something else. Like uh, if you want to watch a Netflix show or something while you're getting your uh, muscle memory going, making sure you practice it properly is important. But I love doing these because this really just helps build the strength. And then I just vary them. So I always learn an exercise and then vary it. Something like that. And there's my open string thing, always looking for an open string. Natural with plastic. 
Yeah. And super glue. <laughs> um, if I go to a, a, like a salon to get nails done, it costs, uh, what, 12 euros, mm -hmm. you're saying? Yeah, it's probably around the same in the States. And um, this method is, uh, I do it at home, and it's like maybe $5 a year. Because I buy a whole bunch of plastic nails, and then, you know, I glue these on. Um, and it's also easier when I'm traveling. If I have an issue, I don't have to find a place. I can just fix it myself. Um, but the tone, I started with just, we were talking before, uh, the workshop started, I started with just the natural nails. And on this guitar, the natural nail... You can hear a difference. The natural nail is very thin. And I just recently started covering this nail to give more of a depth to the bass, because before it was kind of a little bit thin. So yeah, I like doing that. It, it takes a little bit of guts to start doing that, because when I started doing it, you know, you're hand, you know, at the uh, at the rest restaurant, and you're handing money to someone, and they look at your nails. <laughs> <laughs> but after you get used to it, I still sometimes, if I if I am like in a picture, you know, with you people, I still do this. I don't know why. Like, a, like I don't know. <laughs> but. anybody else? You add compression all the time. Compression is just on the kalimba. Yeah. So uh, the kalimba has. Let me let me plug that in. Let me do another. Only the kalimba. Only the kalimba, yeah. Percussion, or uh, compression on an acoustic guitar is like a, I don't, I don't typically like the sound of it. Some people do. Um, I like to hear like the full dynamics because sometimes if you're playing um, really loud percussive things and then soft, like um, I like, it makes everything an even volume and sometimes you want something really soft and then you want the dynamic of so I don't tend to put uh, compression on everything. Without compression, it smooths out just a little. It's subtle. Nobody, I notice. No, maybe people don't notice, but. This is a uh, Paul McCartney song called I Will. Adjusting, adjusting reverb, the most yes, important the reverb, thing. The parameters, the... the uh, yeah. The what I, I really love a long and dark decay. So if I have a lot of reverb 
Um, I like to have a decay, so for instance, let me do this one right here. Um, I'll put the decay, I usually like to have up pretty high. So it goes for a while, but I'll turn the level down. So you can still hear it, but it's not as active unless I play really loud. Then it's going to kind of activate it. So it's a little bit more subtle. So decay up and level down. And then I like the color of it. So instead of like a... That's kind of bright. I like a darker... Like that. I played in... Um, I did a tour with... Uh, a couple years ago, I used to tour a lot with Andy McKee, and we played a uh, couple of cathedrals in England. And there was one cathedral that had like um, maybe 150 foot ceiling, and when you play a chord, it just kind of like swirled back and forth. And some of it they had panels up, and some of it was just the stone. And the way that the decay, like any note that you play, is still going to be ringing somewhere like five, six, ten seconds later. And so I loved. I so I tried to find the pedals that give that same feeling. So a long and dark decay as opposed to uh, real bright. It's a little bit too bright, so I'd like to do a long... Let's do it like this. It's like a deep... You, you, you like dark, dark, dark? I like dark. Darker. Yeah. Uh, long and we long and dark. Yeah. Long and dark and level and level a little. This one I have it a little. Yeah, I usually keep it a little bit lower, like this. Like that. I like that sound. Yeah. Thank you. I have another question for curiosity. You have mm -hmm. your exercises for guitar, and when you started with the kalimba, do you have uh, your own exercises to strengthen? No, technical aspects of the... Yeah, yeah. I started with doing, um, so I have one song, this might be a good example. I have one song where I wanted like a... I can't remember the melody now, but I'm... So I would just literally take a, a little section and make an exercise out of it. That's from a tune of mine called November, and I would just practice this and try to... small section of music and make that the exercise. So usually in, in my own songs, I, I will uh, play to a point where I feel like, okay, this always feels rusty, or I'm always struggling with this. Then I zoom in on that and practice that. So with the kalimba, it was sort of a start. With the, I think the first riff that I ever wrote with, the, once I had the kalimba, like that, and then trying to do... achieve hand independence over time or did you just practice by knowing the sequence and then just playing the notes one after the other? Uh, if I understand, like, um, like knowing this hand and then knowing his hand and putting them together? Is that what you're asking? Or I mean, 
like is, memorizing? Is your right hand independent of your <coughs> left hand? Uh, ah, yeah, uh, I tried a lot. Like so, when I was first doing the kalimba, I tried to like you know, like I said, focus on this hand and focus on this hand. Um, now I think I find it best for my brain, at least, to not think about two separate things, but to try to integrate it into one. So, for instance, a good exercise to to get the concept is instead of thinking. Um, do you know uh, Tommy Manuel has like a really? I think this is originally from Chet Atkins, but like. And then he adds the other. If you think about it in terms of one, two, three, four, one, and then try to put the bass line in, it's always messing with your brain. But it, like, pretend if you see tab, don't think about it vertically, right? I'm sorry, don't think about it horizontally. Think about it this way. So this takes place, like, line up every musical event. So this is at the same time. independent parts, even though you hear independent parts, think one musical event at a time. And I think that actually helps the brain grab the pattern better. Because what I did with that, I just, I take, you know, because I like to do this, is I'll, I'll overcomplicate it just to practice it instead of going like... So I have, this is at the same time. Does that make sense? So independence, in, in the end, yes, you do have independence, but I try to learn things together at the same time. So yeah, same. so you learn the whole sequence and you play individually. Yeah. I mean, not, not individually, but everything on the run. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Were you playing piano when you were younger? A little bit, but I hated it. I hated it. I'm, I'm the classic story of, you know, like 20 years later after piano. Oh, I wish I stuck with it. What you practice now? What's that? You were practicing. I practiced yeah. when I was very young. Yeah. Yeah, I practiced a little bit of piano and then I did trumpet. And then once I got to guitar, it's like it just, not only is it cool, it just, it felt, it fits right, you know. And on piano, they, you know, you think uh, with your key, C, D, E, and guitar, you have to think kind of a different way because you have a C here and here. They're all the same notes. It's just a different way of thinking, you know. So that made more sense to me than piano. But piano players do that all the time. It's it's independence, but you're learning the same sequence. At the, you know, uh, if you watch a great organ player that does like with their feet. You know, you have like the bass parts with your feet and then multiple, like, if they start thinking of this and this and this and this, I don't, I don't know, for me, my brain has to just kind of like learn all of it at the same time, you know, um, I think that's the best way to do it. You're going to play the concert also, singing and playing in time. Totally, absolutely, because there's a lot of times if you start thinking, oh, I have the, the rhythm of my strum pattern and then the rhythm of the syllables, oh my gosh, you have to, you have to integrate it, yeah. Totally. We have time for one more question. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. One, one last one. question. Uh, well, maybe I can end with this. I think it's really important. Um, when, like, for practicing, like what I typically do. A lot of times you hear, okay, practice. So practice three hours a day. Practice four hours a day. How much do you practice? What do you practice? Here's here's what's super helpful for me. I make a big list. Everything I want to work on. All of the exercises that I want to work on are songs that goes on a list and that goes on my wall. And every day I sit down, I look from that list and I choose sometimes 10 or 15 or 20 minute increments from that list. I just choose what I want to work on that day. And then the next day, it's different because I'm not going to work on all of those every day. I'll just choose some of those. And so instead of doing one thing and then practicing it until you get it and nail it, uh, I'm kind of a big, that's, that's good, but I have, I'm, I'm kind of more of a fan of work on a lot of things at the same time. So every day you're kind of chipping away at something. Um, and that, that's a super helpful method for me. Instead of just pick one thing, work on it, and then move on to the next thing. Because by the time you go to the next thing, and then you go to the next thing, 
the stuff that you worked on before can get a little bit rusty. So I just kind of keep a big list and I know that's what I'm working on and then six months down the road I'm really clean at all of those things as opposed to just one at a time and then I lose my focus or you know that makes sense so mm -hmm. all right well thank you guys so much for having me stay inspired I'm really happy to be here and I hope you guys have a wonderful lifelong journey with music mm -hmm.